off top humidity it sucks in part because the way that we cool our body is with sweat the sweat alone doesn't cool us it is the act of evaporating the sweat off of your skin that cools you and so when the air is full of moisture you can't evaporate the sweat and you can't get cool play the music this is the dominique foxworth show there you go new lesson for you hmm I think I knew that one. You did? Yeah. I just learned it. It so, was new to me. You know what really grinds my gears sometimes? Oh, gosh. What's People that? who pretend that weather doesn't affect them. Oh. I... The f- worst. <laughs> oh, I'm not hot when it's 100 degrees. <laughs> oh, I don't care about getting sunburned. I'm not cold in this 15 degree weather. You're not You're not tougher than the weather. That's a, you're not. That's an aggressively European take. <laughs> <laughs> You're mad at other people who are not nearly as affected by the sun. No, as you. no, no, no. That's no. it. That's it. It's no, a, no, no, that's no, no, aggressively no, no, European no, no, take. No, 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 no. I promise you that you were on a sideline of a football field once where there was a lineman not wearing sleeves, and you were like, "Look uh, at this dumb mother." Yeah. Why are you not wearing sleeves? You know you're cold. That's fair. Those I never understood those people. That was ridiculous. It was like some mental toughness thing. Whatever. Yeah. Put on a shirt. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. It's okay to feel hot when it's 100 degrees. We all we all do. Yeah. It sucks. It's the sweating. That's I, yeah. New Orleans. My gosh. It's the hottest I feel you like can, I've ever been. You can feel it yeah. walking Were through you, it. I just remember we had. To, I forgot what happened. Something happened. Maybe it was Bounty Gate, but something happened. I was. Uh, leader in the union so we had to go down there during training camp and I got off of a plane it was one of those planes that you get off right on the tarmac and it felt like I was walking through like soup yeah. just the air was so thick that I was like how do people work in these conditions it's the first time I went to New Orleans was in July Ugh. after I think I was like going into my junior year of college and I was just so sweaty and drunk. Yeah. So sweaty and drunk. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> All right. Well, um, football. NFL. Football rocks. <laughs> Does it? I mean, <laughs> it's I, it's a terrible <laughs> intro to what we're about to talk about. No, it's not. I mean, it, it's fun. It's great. I enjoy it. The season is about to start. But before we get into the season, I, it just came to my attention. Just looking around, getting ready for all this. I noticed that it feels like we've had more serious injuries and in, the preseason than we're used to. And I'm not sure that that's true, but we've certainly had more stoppages yeah. of games, just like the complete, like we're not going to continue. This happened twice this preseason, which I can't remember it happening before. Like I looked up until 2020, I didn't see anything up until 2020. I didn't look before that, but I can't imagine that if it happened once it did that it happened uh, multiple times. So it's just absurd. And then I was thinking, this is a reaction to DeMar Hamlin. Yeah. It's like now it's on the table that we can cancel games. So there's a lot of things about this that's interesting to me. We always felt about this as players. Right. And the league and the coaches now frame this as uh, we can't ask our guys to go back out there and play. Yes, you will. <laughs> you, we didn't last year, DeMar Hamlin, because... His heart stopped. Right. Um, I don't know what the protocol will be going forward, but I can't imagine that we're going to have games canceled every time someone is carted off. And I feel so insensitive saying that, but uh, the show has continued to go on. And I think the, the most concerning thing about this is as we try to make this game safer, Few, very few of these hits that ended these games or that caused serious injuries were preventable. Right. There was one, the uh, the Daywood Davis hit the Dolphins and Jaguars. That was an illegal hit. Uh, and they spent, there was about eight minutes left in the game. They spent like 12 minutes talking about it. They brought out uh, McManus and Wilkins, the reps for each team to discuss it and eventually called it off. That was an illegal hit. The Pats and Packers game, Isaiah Bolden, he ran into a teammate. It yeah. was like random. The Browns and Eagles game, Tyree, Tyree Cleveland tried to go up and catch a ball and his head hit the ground. Nothing you can do about it. Uh, Moro Ojamo was a defensive tackle in that game who his helmet hit the hip of his teammate. Nothing you can do about that. John Walford, regular old sack. They yeah. just sacked him and uh, they like whipped his neck and his head hit the ground in that. And then they put him on the board and carted him out. Only one of those 
was like against the rules. Yeah. The rest of them are just like random football injuries. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really interesting how this plays out if something like this happens in a regular season game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we learned a little bit about the nuts and bolts of what happened with DeMar Hamlin right. um, from the team's perspective over the course of the offseason. And Josh Allen gave an interview where he was essentially a conduit between the, I think, coaching staff and the NFL, really, and, and the teammates. And he said that he had to ask. When the NFL said to start warming up, you have 15 minutes before the game starts again. He had to ask his teammates if they were willing to play. And he said he really regretted doing that because someone basically stood up and was like, absolutely not. We're not playing. Mm -hmm. And then everyone was like, "Okay, good. We're all on the same page. It's off. But in doing that, one, it can sort of separate. I'm sure you'd realize that if you're the person who has to ask, you're no longer really a representative of the players if you have to ask your teammates. But two. People talk about player empowerment. Yeah. If you can decide not to play, that is the biggest step that the players have to sort of changing stuff. I hate that I'm jaded. Yeah. But I'm jaded and I've never trusted. I'll tell you this story. Um, I've, I think I might have told you this before, but I don't think I've told it on here. So when I was an executive committee member, uh, which is like a vice president of the union, I was an active player and we had a lot of we had like a rash of players being arrested and it wasn't like crazy it just was like a few in a row i think it was nba all-star weekend happened we had a bunch of guys get arrested there and there was some more stuff happening uh there were bigger issues and we as players in our desire to have a partnership with the league we also recognize that this is bad for all of us we know that our money comes from sponsorships for one place and no team or no company wants to be associated with a league that is viewed as full of criminals. Now, obviously we recognize that that wasn't true and everybody's done the research that like uh, professional athletes and NFL players are less uh, criminal than their counterparts at the same age of regular people. Like the percentages are much better for athletes than anyone else. So like we all recognize that, but it doesn't matter because these things get popularized and then the image Tire becomes profile, yes. yeah, then the image of the league becomes a problem that impacts all of our money. So we uh as executive committee and then as a subcommittee went in and talked to the league about what we can do about this. And we were comfortable with as a union with extending Uh, more power essentially to Roger Goodell and the league to punish some of these players in ways that we hadn't before. If you think about prior to that time, you kind of waited for a conviction essentially before you would penalize someone. And we were like, nah, we can do that because we agree that we're on the same page. We gave them that power. We have never gotten it back. Yeah. And so that was something Roger Goodell has abused for a decade or decade and a half now. And, and, for whatever reason, you can argue that it's been good or bad because the image of the NFL has been strong, mostly. Lots of companies want to be associated with it. It probably has been good and bad. Yeah, the revenue has gone up. But what, as a, a union member, your job is to protect the rights of all the players. Yeah. And that has not been held up. A lot of players' rights have been infringed upon because of a mistake that we made back then. Long way to say, I get nervous now when... Christian Wilkinson and McManus are walked out there to have a conversation because that not only defrays some of the responsibility, but defrays some of the blame. Yeah. And it is not the responsibility of a man whose job it is to stop the run and rush the passer. It's not his responsibility to weigh all of the things that come into play when it comes to making a major decision like that. So I like seeing them be in this position. I like that Josh Allen uh, was looked at as a leader in that moment, but I would warn them, don't trust them. <laughs> yeah. And that's what part one of the things that Josh Allen said is he was like, it was really regrettable to even do that in right. the first place. Um, but my question to you is, I, you, I don't know if you've told this story in the podcast, but something you said before is like you realized um, essentially you were a football commodity when you were at a practice at a higher level. I don't remember it was college. Yeah, it was college. And it's just someone gets injured and it's just yeah. move it, move 15 yards and start running, you know, yeah, we had, we had a receiver who couldn't was like momentary paralyzed in practice. We moved the drill down while a helicopter came and picked him up and we continued to practice. Yeah, I have tons of stories like that one. But that was the first time my freshman year where I was like, oh, this is yeah, I, I'm a cog in the machine. I'm not special. They're going to roll us in and out. 
to make this machine work. Well, so isn't this sort of the, at least sort of the counterpoint where it's not like we aren't just going to move it 15 yards. It feels like it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. And I guess I shouldn't be looking at this through a lens of like credit or blame for the NFL. That's the wrong way to look at it. It's like what's right or wrong. And And I guess it's what's real and what's not real. Yeah. Like if this is a regular season game, if this is different, like the stakes are different than preseason, which is largely stupid and irrelevant to begin with. Yeah, I, I'm sure that the NFL has left no stone unturned. Once they saw how, like, clumsily, frankly, the DeMar Hamlin, um, the post-DeMar Hamlin situation was handled, I imagine that they have instituted some new protocols for how this all works. And as callous as it sounds, my guess, and, like, this is not based on any reporting other than my experience with working with people in the league, is that they have – they have lines drawn. They have yeah. clear lines drawn that weren't drawn before. And while the preseason is like, eh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> let, let it happen in a situation like last year. I think there are some lines drawn, and I don't know what those are. I certainly don't want to speculate on that. But we're not going to see guys get put on boards, and that means the game is old, yeah. over. And to be honest with you, if – um. I guess Mike McDaniel said like he looked in his players' eyes and he could see that they were in no position to play. For us, it ain't no different in the regular season, but we just like, I've told you this, you know, I was on the field when Kevin Everett um, was paralyzed. We were in Buffalo on kickoff return. He was on kickoff team. He hit Dominic Hickson and didn't get up. And they took him to the hospital and we had no idea. Like he wasn't, it wasn't like this thumbs up situation as you caught off the field. Like we saw with some of these players or like we do see with some players where you're like, Oh, they're just taking extra precautions. He's fine. It's easier to keep playing. That's what that thumbs up means more than anything. It's like, Hey guys, go ahead. Keep doing what you're doing. Like at least, you know, it's a nice marker for us to like, all right, they're just being extra careful. DeMar Hamlin, he couldn't do that. Yeah. And the reports that we heard from some of the players on the field, like that's a hard, hard thing to come back from. So we continue to play. We played the game. It was fine. And we've gotten used to it. Uh, we're capable of doing it. But it's a hard thing to ask a player to do. And we've always done it. And we're going to continue to do it. Like I, I don't think that we're going to turn over some new leaf where now it's like this conscious NFL. Well, it's also, I mean, yeah, the NFL – the NFL's towing a fine line here. Yeah. We've like, there's TV rights, there's gambling revenue, there's player safety, and they're going to balance the three of those together. And how the scales balance is, I'm sure we both agree, going to be a lot less about morality and player safety than it is about profit at the end. Yeah. I mean, and it's all about the, uh, the profit is directly tied to the image also. Mm-hmm. And I do think that that matters. Uh, they don't want to be viewed as the callous league that doesn't care, but I don't think that they can. Yeah. Cause I think most people are conditioned or at least primed to this. Uh, they know what they signed up for. Well, that's been the change in the last 10 years yeah. since like what we've learned about CT and concussions, right. there's sort of a tacit agreement being like, you're not playing football blind now. Right. You know what you're, what the risks are, and you know what you're doing to your body. Yeah, and I'm biased, yeah. but that's not enough for me. No, because I I recognize what how players got here, and you started playing football when you were ten. If you're me, you start playing when you're ten. You're better than everyone else, and they're like, all right, you're good at football. Keep playing. Then you get to high school. And you're like, oh, you're really, you know, you could go to college. Yeah. Through this, you know, a better college than you would have gotten to or been able to afford before. So why don't you keep playing? And then you do it, and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm good at this. Hey, you keep playing. You know, you could make a million dollars if you play. And then you keep going. So like, at no point am I as a football player making a reasoned adult decision about entering this at every step of the way i have been encouraged by someone more and it's not to relieve any of a responsibility we have to that but it's also to understand that just saying well they know what they signed up for or they make a lot of money like to me is so callous it's definitely callous but i think that's the calculation the league has made and i also think that's the calculation of um uh, maybe unknowingly, but that's something that football fans have become yeah. accustomed to in the last 10 years where there was a moral outrage of being like, how did you lie to the players about what was going on? And now you're just accustomed to it because right. it's known. And to your point yet, there are a lot of smart people who would continue to play football yeah. throughout all of this because when you're really good at something, it's really 
fun. Not everyone's Chris Borland. Not right. everyone is going to change their career because of something that they view as morally wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I guess I'm a fan too. So it yeah. feels like I'm being football rocks. That's yeah. how we started this. <laughs> I feel it's like still it, rules. I don't know. I feel like I, it, I sometimes come off as like judgmental when it comes to this stuff, particularly when it comes to the fans because they are insensitive. And I remember after Mar Hamlin, that was a big thing that I like the next day on get up, it just was happened that I was on. And that was the big thing that frustrated me was, the outpouring of love from fans and stuff kind of annoyed me. Yeah. Not because it was wrong, but because like, I don't really give a shit. <laughs> you know, like it, it's, it, I don't know. And it, it's, it's, um, my bias is certainly showing and I recognize that, but I can't pretend like it's not there that when, when it comes to us having some sort of labor strife, we like, we saw it over the running backs thing. So many people, when we talk about running backs, deserve more like, hey, they're not valuable enough, play a different position. Like, uh. well, I think it's, I think it's a little bit harsh to be about the particular, the DeMar Hamlin stuff, because like the fans are yeah. just normal people in a lot of stuff. And like, if we're being honest, a lot of them were like, holy shit, I just saw someone die on TV. Yeah. And so like, regardless of, how they think about football in the larger macro sense in that moment they were just like what's going on this is horrible i can't right. believe because like, it was everyone who watched that game or the ad it was like an oddly emotional thing it yeah. was deathly silent and all everyone had to like sort of reassess how they felt about monday night football this game yeah. to our hamlin etc cetera, etc cetera. so i don't i don't think any of that stuff was um necessarily insincere the insincere stuff on social media was about like scoring points by sending like yeah. you know prayers yeah to i mean I, that's why i said today. that i'm acknowledging my bias yeah. is because i don't think i'm right i'm yeah. just telling you my, no, no. my honest reaction was like okay so you guys recognize the risk that we're taking and you recognize how dangerous this is and this is again all based in my bias and pa experiences like so then next time we have a work stoppage don't tell us to shut up and play this That's is all. this is where i where i fall on this because i i'm from the fan side of it and this is where fans often get looked at as pro management yeah they're not they're pro themselves right and it's what it always comes down to it's mm -hmm. like can I feel good about watching this? Can my team be good? Can the can my rooting interests or my gambling interests be fulfilled? Yeah. And like that's really normal because also most fans are not diehard fans. Yeah. And that's like or or like people who want to think about the ramifications of the sport, any sport. Yeah, I, I I'm the same way. Yeah. So like I I just sometimes I, the emotional thing and it gets in me and I yell, but like it's just uh, because I knew we were gonna talk about this, like I just tried to do some quick like research and look into like the history of these type of serious injuries and they're more than I think people yeah. probably remember. I, I'm sure most people remember Ryan Shazier and they remember Kevin Everett and there's Mike Utley and Dennis Bird and Reggie Brown and then Daryl Stingley one yeah. is a, a infamous one that I think people if they don't remember they were reminded when um Derek, Derek Sting Stingley was being drafted. I remember that came up a bunch of times but Whatever. It's a it's a um risky, uncomfortable for people who don't know this, there should there is Daryl Stingley got paralyzed by Jack Tatum, who was a safety for the Raiders, who mm -hmm. wrote a book about it called They Call Me Assassin, um, which is something that shows how different football was. Yeah. I think about fifty years ago, it was in the seventies. Yeah. Um completely legal hit. Yeah. But the outcome is you would expect that um you would at least pretend. Yeah. To, and Daryl Stingley was someone who's on track to be a Hall of Fame receiver yeah. for the Patriots at the time. Yeah, um, he was a great player. All right. Well, there is no easy segue out of that, but we can go from that football to more football. College football started. I watched uh, some of the USC game, and Caleb is great. <laughs> I saw in that game he had four touchdown passes, like 270, but it was 11 yards in a temp, which yeah. is outrageous. He had that one, like, highlight play so i saw that he he injured or like he did something to his hand and he's like shaking it out the next play he can't catch the snap so it fumbles behind him and he runs back and picks it up and just launches a blind bomb for a deep touchdown and yeah just please don't get hurt don't get hurt and one of my favorite things about that play people there were you saw all the stuff online Ooh, caleb williams is a problem for things like <laughs> those stupid tweets but <laughs> The, the receiver was so open because yeah. of the broken play because right. of the fumble. There were actually two receivers yep. down there and no defensive backs. Wide, <laughs> wide open. Um, the biggest takeaway is I, I met Zachariah Branch. I was introduced to him, which if you don't know, 
I'm sure you will learn who he is soon. You probably he his um punt return t- or kickoff ret- oh, it was a punt return touchdown, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it? Kickoff? Well, anyway, he had a return touchdown that I'm sure you saw on on Twitter if you were around because he was killing it. But then when I went back and watched the game. He just looks so amazing. A true freshman yeah. wide receiver, number one for USC. He is a future first round pick. I think I heard him comp to Deshaun Jackson. I was about to say, looks exactly like, like Deshaun Jackson. That's on it, the, the field. number one. Yeah. He just, it is so incredible. He like, he has a, a patience and awareness that you don't recognize in any players, but a true freshman, just to be, he was a part of a, a I think, a state championship. 100 teams so he's fast as hell too or uh relay teams fast as hell too yeah that that dude uh to use the parlance of corny internet people is a problem i love it um yeah but that was that was a big takeaway from this weekend notre dame blew out um navy nobody really cares notre yeah, I mean, dame's gonna be highly ranked and then yeah sam Hartman's then, like 35 years old playing quarterback for them <laughs> then they're gonna um get blown out in the playoffs as they do uh that's the case but next week is when football uh, really starts. Are there teams or players that you're really excited about? There are a few things I'm excited about, well, which I'll pitch you on. And there, I'm look. I've got SEC bias. Yeah, you're it's, you're a Vandy guy. Yeah, which I mean, you guys are technically in SEC. I mean, look, we're the doormat. We're not a real SEC team. You beat Hawaii this week. Look, nice job. Clean as hell. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, this guy probably is going to not have a good year, but he could throw the ball really far and that's joe milton at tennessee he's the first thing so joe milton huge recruit went to michigan they gave him the job he couldn't hit the broad side of the barn he transferred to tennessee hendon hooker beat him out hendon hooker gets hurt he plays decently last year he's 6'5 240 and he can throw the ball 90 yards um and just imagining him in that offense that pretty much just runs all nines (laughs) if he can figure it out a little bit and by the way This is not joking that he can throw the ball 90 yards. He can actually throw a football 90 yards. There's about nothing. There's about no like projectile that (laughs) he can't launch in a way that's going to be entertaining. I've seen I've seen it and it it looks like a punt. It's so high and deep. The um, he's going to go in the first round next year, no matter what he does. Right. What's going to happen if he has like a pretty good year? Mm. He's going to go in the first round yeah, and he's going to go high. We've talked about this and this yeah. is the this We can put this on the board of of my common sayings is uh, just about the closed ecosystem of the NFL. When there is something that happens, the copycat league nature of it, it just becomes an epidemic. Mm-hmm. And Joe Milton sounds like he's going to be the a, a top 10 pick because of Josh Allen. It, I think it's Josh Allen and Justin Herbert. Because I think yeah. Justin Herbert went below Tua right. because there was still the concept of like longer term success in college, processing accuracy. Tua has to go ahead of him. Yeah. Herbert, Allen, um, who else? I, I mean, I guess. I mean, Anthony Richardson just yeah. went well, in the right. top five because I, of it. I guess I was thinking of examples that led to this this evolution or this mutation where there were people who actually had success. I think that Herbert's had success based on, in his evaluation was based on tools and it felt like we went to a place where they're like all right find me the biggest toolsiest guy that wasn't always the case i think i actually think that uh mahomes is part of this too yeah and i think he was toolsy he was under drafted right so the mahomes thing is crazy because we didn't know when mahomes was drafted that he upped he was conscious enough of how he was playing college football to know that he's like looking around his team and he's like my team sucks i have to raise my risk profile right. for us to have a chance we we know that since he's talked yeah. about that but at the time he's a top 10 pick because matt Nagy was like look at this freakish arm talent yeah and that's really what it came down to right but what's trey lance gonna do to this <laughs> Cause like, Great question. Because, I mean, Carson Wentz, I think, falls yeah. in this category also yes. as somebody who was big and toolsy but didn't have an incredibly impressive college resume from uh, North Dakota State. Yes. I'll get it right this time. Um, also where Trey Lance went. But this is how these things go is someone does something special and a couple people like it and maybe a couple other people do the same thing and then everyone tries to do it mm-hmm. until it no longer works. How many – Trey Lance's do we need before they give up on this? I mean, it's Richardson and Milton are going to change it significantly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Richardson uh, gets, is he a part of the Josh Allen effect or part of the Lamar Jackson effect? Josh. You think it's definitely Josh Josh Allen? 
Yeah. I mean, I think even Justin Fields uh, yeah. is, is a huge part of, of Anthony Richardson because we talked we comp yeah. Anthony Richardson's floor if it's a if it's a well run team to what Justin Fields was last year. Right. So um, there I mean, is there anybody who did anyone try to copy the Lamar Jackson thing? Or I guess you can't because they aren't players like I guess just, Kyler Murray is a yeah. freakish athlete like that. Also, I would say, yeah, Lamar is so unique because, yeah, they built a whole offense around him, but he's. I mean, you had this one. You had this when you said you played against RG three, where you're like, "It's a high school offense. We can't. We still can't stop him. Yeah. It doesn't matter." And Lamar is like that. He's one of one because the fact of the matter is like, he's the best athlete on the field pretty much every NFL game he's in. Yeah. The weird thing about Lamar was he didn't run. He wrote. He ran a more pro style offense in college yeah. than he did initially in NFL. We're all excited to see what he does uh, now that they've gone back to the future i yeah. guess and they're gonna give him a pro style offense but yeah I, I don't know i just been thinking a lot about that particularly with quarterbacks it happens in other positions but you can look back and say that i think josh allen is directly responsible for trey lance getting all that money i think i mean i think you can look at this quarterback class and you have it with all of them um with the one this is supposed to be a great upcoming draft class um and caleb is the one who's supposed to be the first right one of the Mahomes generation who's playing in a different way. Yeah. Um, but Caleb, I guess Caleb for me, he's always going to go yeah. high. Of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. He, I guess I was thinking about the people like Richardson is the perfect example. Richard, well, he doesn't go high in look any at, draft. Look at, okay. Say Joe Milton goes in the first round right. because of this say Quinn Ewers at Texas, Texas is going to be favored in every game this year, except for against Alabama, or mm -hmm. at least that's the way it's looking now on, on betting apps. And Quinn Ewers is someone who's six two, probably skinny, but he has an electric and whippy arm. Mm -hmm. If he has a good year, people are going to talk about the fact that just ball placement, arm talent, he needs to be go at the top of the draft because he can do things other guys can't. And will he be Zach Wilson? Maybe. Yeah. Will was, he be really good? Maybe. That was the name that I was thinking of. Yeah. Zach Wilson is definitely a, a Mahomesian disciple. Mm -hmm. Like He is a part of the Mahomes effect. Yeah. And it hurt the Jets. So I don't know what the future is for any of this, but I guess that... <sighs> There will come a time when we cycle back away from the toolsy guys and go back to like who produced. And I wonder, I guess that's the thing is like if Anthony Richardson falls off and then one more guy falls off, then we have a track record. Well, unless there's a couple guys who succeed. Well, in the, the thing is, it's like if Anthony Richardson's good and Bryce Young and Kyler Murray are too small. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, future Russell Wilson's. But we're going to be looking for the six six two forty guy. The funny thing about all this is, and this goes back to like the 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 uh, my little thought that I think deserves to to be uh, held on to about the closed ecosystem of the NFL is we accept that some of these things are fact because they prove out to be true, but they only prove out to be true because this is not a true survival of the fittest business environment. Like it's a closed ecosystem with 32 teams that will succeed no matter what. So there's only 32 chances and there are only so many quarterbacks brought into the league every year. If all of the teams believe that this is the way to build the quarterback and then two of them have success, we're like, Oh, well, that's the way to do it. When in actuality, it doesn't mean that that's the way to do it. That's the way that you guys decided to to make it work. And if there was a, which is why all the great innovation in football happens in college, because there's a different situation where there are there's a an environment where there are great talent disparities and great coaching disparities and uh, yeah, rosters are twice Ros as big. Yeah, and yeah. so you find situations where a team is like, all right, in order for us to compete, we got to think of something new. That never happens in the NFL. So, but where do you fall on this on the tools you guys with the quarterbacks? Because I, where I fall on this mm -hmm. is I fall closer to the teams like the obviously as pro Richardson. Right. Like I fall closer to the idea that when you're drafting a quarterback, you are essentially, unless you have Kyle Shanahan as your coach and you can win with C plus quarterback play, you need to have someone who has a rare set of skills mm -hmm. that can actually win you football, like win you high leverage football games. Right. And your chances of doing that go up immensely if you draft someone with those tools. Yeah. You know where I sit on this. If you're good, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, um, it's about the organization. I hate it, but it's true. And so, I mean, that's what I think is like, there are so few of these guys that are just special. Yeah. I think more often than not, 
if you have a special skill and mm-hmm. you have a coach that can build around that special skill and you have talent that accentuates that special skill, you're more likely to succeed. So if I am choosing um, a guy who doesn't have a special skill but has a track record of success versus a guy who has a special skill and my roster is the same either way, I go with the guy with the special skill because yeah. then it gives you something that you can do something. And I mean, that's how I've always felt about running ability. It's less of, I'm less of an outlier now, but I just from playing in the league, the few times when we played against somebody like back in my youth, uh, <laughs> we didn't have as many athletic quarterbacks. The few times that we did that, it was hell. Yeah. And I was like, why doesn't everybody do do this? And eventually they started to catch up. But yeah, that's, pretty much. Yeah, everyone is. Unless you can like, you know, Vince Vaughn and the wedding press, just make it rain out there. Put it anywhere you want. Like, yeah, well, there are not too many Dan Marinos walking <laughs> no. through that door. I guess Aaron Rodgers is the more appropriate uh, contemporary where the accuracy is such. And I guess Tom Brady, obviously. Yeah, falls Brees in that for a long too. time. It's just yeah, like put it anywhere. Where the yeah. accuracy is so good that it doesn't even matter. That was kind of my always my thought for quarterback play is the thing that I want more than anything. And maybe this doesn't qualify for you as a special skill is accuracy. No, it definitely does. Yeah. Like if you can put it anywhere, you can beat good coverage. You don't have to read. If you can put it exactly where you want to put it, then you're, you're, you're set and, and ability to run. If you can give me those two things, I'm great. Yeah. Don't need a big, strong arm. All right. Mm. This was fun. I like it when people can throw it far. Yeah, it is fun. I like it too, especially since I don't have a team. I just wanted you to give me something entertaining. All right. Roses and thorns. He's so good. How is Dominique been lately? Bad or good? Let's find out. This is Roses and Thorns. All right. My favorite part of the show with my favorite person. Hi, honey. What's up, bud? So this is Roses like and thorns. the last of its kind, right? Which I think is maybe a oh, good yeah. thing. Maybe we've run our course, but we're going to Yeah, Roses and Thorns it is uh no longer going to be on Monday. We're going to push it to the end of the week. Uh and hopefully Or maybe we have more things to talk about. We are. So yeah, <laughs> I think the last couple we we both agreed the last couple episodes were not or the last couple segments. I don't know if I of, agree. I okay. might disagree. Well, either way, I think it is. So <laughs> we I've tried to professionalize it a little bit more and I sent you a show doc with a bunch of articles he of things to talk about. He sent me it this morning, by the way, at 9 a.m. I did it last night I know, at 2 which, No, I know. I respect your work ethic. Um, but I'm just saying, like, I was like, oh, shoot. I got to I gotta get prepared. Oh, Don't man. I, and I had some stuff I had to do, too. Um, so I was like, I don't got no time to do this. <laughs> so when it bombs today on it's my end, gonna bomb. It's know gonna be that it's because I got this. There we go. Well I done. Mean. You lowered the bar. So I, no matter I'm what. I'm great at lowering the bar. Like, that has been, like, historically, yeah, like, yes. I like to, which is really bad. And, like, now that I have kids and I see, I heard Avery kind of describing something like that recently. Like, basically, like, I knew I was, like, smart in school right particularly like high school is when I remember first like consciously doing it but I'm like I don't need to let people know that because then like when I am smart it can surprise them versus like if they expect me to be smart all the time when I can't think of a word or yeah. when whatever then they feel let down and they're like she isn't really smart nobody's really so, let down I, I don't know that we're very different in that way which I guess is one of the reasons that work because I think I go out of my way to present that I am uh like more I guess more competent, not that competent makes it seem like a low bar, but like more exceptional than I actually am. And like, I like a high but bar. But dare I suggest, this might be getting too deep. Dare I suggest, is that rooted in like insecurity or like yeah. people not thinking that oh, it's you- not, It's not getting too deep. I definitely yeah. know it's rooted in insecurity, but- Dare I suggest. <laughs> dare I suggest. <laughs> um, I definitely know it's rooted in insecurity, but I still end up succeeding i know like sometimes so. like i hate when i would see you on like shows like like on like get up for instance being like oh i'm the best i'm this i'm that because while i think so many of those things are true like i'm like to me it makes me a little sad too because it's like like it seems like someone who's insecure would say things like that oh well i mean it, like <laughs> he's like hold on hold on hold yeah, on yeah, yeah. i am the best <laughs> no, no 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 i mean that, that that's rooted in fact but i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's certain okay, things that are rooted in insecurity. Like I, I, I've talked about this on this show a bunch of times. Like the, the whole reason that, or major reason that I wanted to go to business school was like rooted in insecurity. It was like I can show that I belong and I'm capable of reaching uh, success in other ways. So yeah, I mean, there's insecurity certainly mixed in with that. But it's funny because I think 
as one you're you're very positive about like uh saying things to lift me up and, and <laughs> we've talked about this, this yeah, is, yeah. yeah that's one of the things that i remember clearly the one time when you were not and you were like <gasps> oh no i said no it wasn't bad i think i, I feel s- so bad what did i say i said something no it wasn't about something you said i said something that that seemed like i wasn't confident and you were like that ain't sexy. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, this well, isn't what I'm used to. However, I can't be too cocky. I got to be like a nice a, fine line, guys. Nice a fine level line. of confidence. No, and I do think like I think sometimes we talk on here about like how we do different things for each other. One of my main things that I do for him is take the kids out Sunday. Oh. Got them mother those little angel babies. Angel babies. <laughs> out. Um, you're welcome. Um, Thank gave you. you some time alone, like, and because th- that really is important to him, especially as we're kind of especially more gotta crowded work, into our space. <laughs> I know, um, but um, but but I know, like, but I go out of my way and like mm-hmm. lie to them. Even I'm like, well, Daddy's not home. Luckily, you were on the patio, so they couldn't find you. They're like, we can just stay. We are old enough to watch ourselves. I'm like, yeah, and that part is not. true. I mean, and my oldest probably is, yeah. but but I'm like, no. And luckily, thank God they could not find you because they went looking. And I was like, I don't know where he is either, and I know he's home, but we're just gonna get out of here, and I'm gonna say he's not home. So that's one thing. But then also, I find like the way that I um, like I the, are like the things we say to each other, and not like of course what you say is less important than what you do but I find and it's not that I'm lying or but I find like over time I tell you like good job like and not like in a condescending way but but make sure to appreciate the things you do and like point out that you do them well and that and you do I things don't do well that for you and that you look don't nice worry. um Let's just get to the point don't I don't think you but what you do for me that's different me. is you talk to me in a way that tries to like don't make me, me happy like or like like uplift me or like if I don't seem down me. like you want to make me seem not down like because to me like being happy like like don't I like that you like being confident um so I do think like I and my words build you up that's more. the rosiest um, thorn I've ever received and you make me like you go out of your way to try to make me feel happy and say things make me happy and do things make me happy whereas I say and do things to try to make you feel like confident I'll say the one time in my life and this is this wasn't on the show sheet none of this was on the show sheet (laughs) because I just got that at nine shoot (laughs) I'm I'm not ready y'all um the one time um in my life where I feel like I had um high expectations of me like people thought I would be smart was when I was in law school I got pregnant my um before or during my the end of my second year of law school and so for my third year at the time like I'm from DC all my family's in DC Dominique was in Baltimore and I for law school was in school in Massachusetts and so they do a visiting program where they let you like do whether it's like in the traditional I think traditionally they send kids to Berkeley um in California but if you want you can come up with your own school to visit especially if you have like extenuating circumstances so I visited at Americans Law School um called Washington College of Law in DC because it was the one that they approved (laughs) in the area between like I looked at other Maryland and DC law schools and so and I love it was honestly a great year of law school for me um like but everyone knew I was coming in from Harvard. And so like the teachers, when they were doing the role the first days, and I'm like sitting there like probably like seven months pregnant on the first day of school. And they're like, oh, you're coming from HLS. And some of the teachers went there and they'd be like, oh, I went there. Like, or the, teacher, the other students be like, oh, you go to Harvard? Like with like judgment and whatever. And I was like, shoot, I actually have to do well. And in that case, it worked out. I think also the pressure of pregnancy, yeah. like knowing that I was going to have this baby and had to figure out like how to finish law school with her. She was literally born like um, in reading week, the week um after Thanksgiving before exams and luckily I had like prearranged to do a lot of papers like chose classes that have yeah. papers instead of finals for as many of those that I could at least so I only had like two finals to take after she was born but that was the one time where I felt this like shoot people have high expectations of me it's scary but also I rose to them so like yeah. it was fine um, or maybe it's just I was smart so yeah. I didn't have to rise to them I don't know it felt like I was rising um, but generally I do not believe so in high vomit. expectations that was That's gross. Like I, Why did you have to say that? Because I remember there are like certain highlights that I remember. You remember lots of things and details. I remember like certain events to mark time. And that year uh, is like marked by a few things. But one of the big things is my car. how you vomited all inside your car. and <laughs> It was his when I took then, it. <laughs> and then parked it and went to class. And then 
dropped it off to get cleaned. I didn't have to clean it, luckily. I know. He was, it was really bad. I was like seven months pregnant driving from our house in Baltimore County to American's Law School, which is in D.C. And I was on like not quite a highway, like a route on 29. Mm. So like a really fast, like four lane road. I mean, not really fast, but like a four lane road. I just got in Chick-fil-A. So thank God I had a big Chick-fil-A cup. Um, and it was like a convertible, like a small car. And I just started vomiting. And I had never even had bad morning sickness in that pregnancy, but it just came out and like I I couldn't pull over because I was like in the middle lane and was trying to get it in as many things. But I didn't want to be late for my first day at this new law school where they might have high expectations of me. So my parents' house was close to America. I parked in their driveway. They were out of town, took one of their extra cars because they were away and left it sitting in like 96 degree heat when I got back. That car smelled so bad. I put the top down and drove it to a detailer and was like, I'm so sorry. Charge me whatever you have to, to, to take care of this. It was so bad. We were already married by then. So yeah. we were, it's nothing you could do to get up out of this. But one of the things on the show sheet to try to transition okay. us back to that, that you can I delete sent, all of that. Editors, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't have to, I can leave it. I like to give production notes from <laughs> why. <laughs> um, I sent you an article from uh, August 9th about the case for marriage. Uh, and, and I read it. You, yeah. Wait, I mean, you, you, <laughs> I guess I, I, the interesting thing, I guess, coming out oh, of it is. I swear I wait. Yeah, you're figuring out your cameras and talking to the audience. So when you talk to them, you talk over there. There's nobody there, people. Yeah. I just and like your the cameras over here. <laughs> it's a recurring problem. And it makes me seem slow. Or maybe I'm just doing it to be funny because I like to keep expectations low of myself. Way to go. You nice comedic. So what do you think of the article? Ahead. Um, So the article that I read. <laughs> <laughs> school of being quizzed but it was interesting because it was saying how like um you know ultimately um people in marriage is like mental health fares better financially you fare better and that may or may not be true but I remember growing up and I don't re necessarily remember feeling this way but I remember like my, my parents have been married now for 40 some years and like my sister would always say and I never noticed this but maybe it's just something I didn't notice that my mom and they're catholic um that my mom was like a big proponent of marriage um and she would say it like in a negative way um and so I think I guard against being like the married friend who says people should get married yeah. but at the same time like which is like that article is like I'm married and it's working for me and I I've I've cherry pick data that shows that marriage is best for everyone mm -hmm. um and so I'm gonna I just went the guy was like I just went to my son's wedding and so yay marriage um and basically saying like like any investment it could go south um you might end up miserable in a messy divorce and lose everything you have um but also chances are it'll be good for you okay. but like yeah of course I'm happily married to you so I agree that this is great but yeah. if you weren't you like I wouldn't want to just be married to anybody under any circumstances like so I think that yeah, like, this is nice, but I'm never going to be someone who's out there saying, like, everyone needs to get married because it's the only way to be happy. No, like, you can be single and be happy. You can cohabitate and be happy. Like, you can, I don't. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, Um, yeah, I guess the best version of either, you could argue that, like, all the financial and whatever and, like, splitting work and all those things make it a little bit easier to be married, but all people aren't the same. Yeah. <laughs> and so like it's different stuff for different people. And also being with the right person really matters yeah. or yeah. being like, it really just made it seem like just find a partner. Any yeah, partner. Any partner. <laughs> I mean, it didn't say that again. I only skimmed the article, but, <laughs> but it might've seemed like it said that if you skimmed it. I do. I do feel like um, we have somewhat of a responsibility to talk about less fun things. So the um dollar general shooting in jacksonville was a racially motivated hate crime a white guy uh put on a bulletproof vest and grabbed a handgun and an ar-15 or assault rifle i don't know if it's ar-15 assault rifle that he legally obtained despite the fact that he uh had um mental health concerns in the past he still legally obtained these weapons and went to a dollar general and killed three black people uh because of writings that they found that he had and also swastikas on his gun and whatnot they and then killed himself yeah yeah then he killed himself he determined that it was racially motivated uh on the weekend of the anniversary of the wash march on washington 
I, feel I think, like- and also though to add, before uh, at least what I saw on GMA, before he went to the Dollar General, or he first pulled up and started changing in a lot, the lot of like a small HBCU yeah. in Jacksonville and the security there. Edward Waters yeah, University, like you know, was like this is suspicious and got him to leave, and then you know alerted Jacksonville police mm. too, and so I think that's interesting too, like. Like in Florida, and again, we like this. We go to Florida more than we should, um, but like where Governor DeSantis um, yeah. has like he just, got booed at the vigil because oh, he should. yeah, I mean yeah, <laughs> because he, he's like assaulted education, not necessarily of black people, but about black people, like education that everyone in the state needs. I mean, um, I think he represents regression yeah. as in general, like intentionally represents regression and. And then to show up at this event after like crippling uh, like diversity and inclusion programs and intentionally miseducating people. And, and this guy's 21. So like he wasn't educated. And even if assuming he's from Florida, I know he lived there, but assuming he actually was from and educated in by the state of Florida, like he wasn't educated in this DeSantis regime necessarily. Mm-hmm. But I feel like people like DeSantis and Trump like like dog whistle and like embolden people like that not to say yeah. that he wouldn't have done it dylan roof did what he did you know before trump like yeah. so not to say that this guy wouldn't have done it without desantis but like desantis makes it so much easier for people to now grow up miseducated and not understanding like you look like you're about to say something I'm yeah sorry. no 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 i think I, I i agree with all of that um uh i think there's a recent history in Jacksonville uh, in that New York Times article about it. They talked about September last year. There was a, a swastika hung swastika swast. There was swastika. a yeah. There was a swastika hung on an overpass. Not a word we like. We don't yeah. know how to say it. Like. Yeah, uh, on an overpass in '95, and then in October, uh, a bunch of anti-Semitic messages were displayed at uh, TIAA Bank Field ahead of the Florida Georgia game. So, I but think, I wonder if you look yeah. at any city, if you can yeah. find. Just, I mean, that's the. It's yeah, not just I, Jacksonville. I, I think I, that's certainly the point I was getting I'm to. It's like no, it's fine. I, I'm not saying that this is just <laughs> Jacksonville, but I, I was like echoing the point that you were making is that I think that these things are uh made to feel like more acceptable now in part because in large part because of positions that politicians have been comfortably taking in in a way that seems disingenuous and for personal or political gain not necessarily personal ideology which i guess it doesn't matter either way but the the final thing that kind of always pops up when they're like these racially motivated things from people who are like not financially like well off it just is it always blows my mind to think that somehow they've been convinced that black people are the problem it's so like he's i can't imagine that he's happy with his life that uh and there hasn't been much about him which i think is by design because people don't want to give a lot of attention to these killers but if you are a 21 year old and you so young yeah like what has gone wrong already in your life that you were this hate filled yeah. um and anyway sorry no no that's fine i i think that's perfect because that you're so hate filled that you, that you don't would take your own life and yeah. other people's like and it might be somewhat tied to like gun laws or also somewhat tied to mental health stuff, but it's not an isolated incident. At and all. the thing that 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 I want to come back to and the real point that I want to walk away with is what I or that I want people to walk away with from my position is that I don't understand how people like this, who obviously he feels like he has no future. Or nothing promising because it's not people who are headed on some promising path. They're like, you know what? Let's get this right. How could these people come to a belief that the problem that needs to be solved is black people need to be killed or Jewish people need to be attacked or Asian people are the the problem? problem. That's the thing that I... I, But I think it's like a crabs in a barrel. Like... Yeah. No, I, mean, I don't know. I, I just, I mean, I think like, I don't want to, I feel like I could end up sounding a way that I shouldn't sound trying to expound upon this. But I think so often, like when you don't have anything, you look at right. like, who do I think should have less than me and why don't they? And I hate them because they don't like, um, 
Yeah. No, that makes sense. I, I, I guess it makes sense. You look around and Jacksonville is a relatively black place. And I imagine growing up in Jacksonville in a situation that you're not happy with and you look around and you see other people around you that you can be easily pointed at, hey, that's the problem. But yeah, it's it's sad. And I think the, the most frustrating and disappointing thing about all of this is like it doesn't feel like an aberration and it doesn't feel like there's a path towards addressing any of this and it just is like I mean, especially when you are letting people get guns so easily not that that would stop it entirely mm -hmm. but a state in which you're letting people get guns so easily you are reducing their access to information like mm -hmm. very intentionally about like the historical roots of some of these problems because not that obviously this kid again was 21 he could have been educated differently, but not that like knowing about these things really is going to make you act different. But I think, I think their argument is like knowing about it's a problem, but no, like, like what's the saying? Like you have to know history so you don't repeat it. Right. And obviously that doesn't always prove true. Sometimes you learn history and you're like, Hey, I like the way this guy did things. It's right. like, I'm going to be like Hitler and hang like, like, so I mean, I please like, don't like clip that sounded so bad that I said that, but I'm just saying like, so obviously it can go wrong. Like learning history, it can inspire people. Um, to do the wrong thing, but I think generally most society operates under the premise that it's important to know the history so that you don't repeat it, so that you can kind of learn how we got where we are um, and how to keep moving forward, um, not regressing. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that transition, that segue from the marriage thing to I think we have a responsibility to be uh, like talk about hard things here. I definitely thought it was like, Marriage can be hard. <laughs> here, that's what you're about to like go because that seemed to make more sense to me. I was like, oh, yeah. "Well, this certainly wasn't on the show sheet, but bring it on because I'm gonna toss it right back at you." So, Marriage can be hard. Yeah, I wasn't gonna say that. You, I feel like you, uh, you're always looking for a chance to toss it right back at me. <laughs> that's like your favorite thing to do. That's that's your move. No. Not out in the regular life, but when here, like that's your move. Let me toss it right <laughs> back at you. Like I, I'm not saying anything mean. I'm not the one who's coming with thorns. I just sit here, make some jokes. I laugh, usually don't smile. come with thorns either. I know. I wasn't saying that you do, but I mean, today I have roses that you. you um, we went to my parents have a place in Bethany, Delaware, and we went there. And it's not like you know the beach oh, trip gosh. at a hotel where like so it's like you know schlepping the kids to the beach and carrying all the stuff and whatever, but that you, and for me, it's, I grew up, my parents had that house since I was four. So I grew up going, even before they had it, we would go to hotels down there. Um, so I grew up going there. So I have like a lot of memories there, which sometimes like around probably like high school age, I just got tired of going. I was like, ah, oh, this little town, I'd rather stay at home and go to like the club on the weekend or whatever. Um, and so I definitely went through a period where I didn't like going, but now that once my kids were old enough to go and enjoy some of the things that I used to enjoy there, um, it's like the nostalgia is its own like thing that makes me like going. Although we do slightly different things, which I also like, like as much as it's like doing the same things that me and my cousins did when we were little, my kids like different things. Like we weren't beach, we didn't like going to the beach when we grew up, we just wanted to go to the community pool. Like um, my kids love the beach, so like, but it makes me like it. But another <laughs> rose for you is that at the beach, my son, two days in a row, the first day we were like, did he get stung by a jellyfish? What happened in his shorts? It was larval crabs, like tiny little crabs from the ocean were getting into his trunks and it never happened to anyone else in our family, it just happened to him. You handled that so well. I would have died. I would have been like, I cannot like get these things away. So that's a rose. You're just Thanks. really good at I'm tired of dealing with kid stuff. Beaches. Honestly. No, I know. And that's, that's the rose, like, I guess, that you survived another beach I trip. Never, and a I harder beach trip. Yeah. In a sense. I, yeah and, and it's never been my idea of vacation, like going to beaches and going to pools. But that is you and your idea of vacation. And you've taught the kids that that is their <laughs> idea of vacation. So we just spent the whole summer them. at beaches and stuff. And so I am not sad that. I, I honestly done. wasn't either. Like, gosh. We didn't do much beach this time because everybody was done. And like yeah. Declan was getting the crabs in his <laughs> trucks within like the first day was probably within 30 minutes of getting there. The second day, I literally I was getting lunch from like the town and bringing it to the beach. I hadn't gotten there from waiting for the lunch yet. Like that's how quick it happened. So, well, this is fun. Vaccine time. Right. For you, there aren't children's ones available anywhere in D.C. right now. I well, can't wait to get vaccinated. All right. Well, roses, thorns, fun. Thanks. Bye. Love this you. This one wasn't fun. Oh, I mean, 
being together is always fun. True. We sandwiched it. Go we marriage. Sandwiched it. Go gave, marriage. Gave him a, a serious sandwich. All right. Bye. Thank Love you. you. Bye. Thank you, Adi Khan. Thank you, Christina Buswell. Thank you, Sarah Abbott. Thank you, Podville. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.